Welcome to this episode of Careers Takeoff, where we learn the very latest about how people get ahead in their careers. I'm your host, Conrad Chua. Tech companies have replaced finance as the largest recruiters of business school graduates. At the same time, many non-tech companies are looking to hire talent to help with their digital transformation efforts. So what are the skills that you as a business school graduate need now? Today's guest will give you some answers. Frederick Kalinka has worked with many business schools to help their students prep for the entire application interview process for companies such as Facebook, Amazon, Google. He'll answer your questions on how to prepare for that process. And hopefully we'll get through the entire 45 minutes without him talking one bit about my football team. So <laughs> welcome, Frederick. Hi, Conrad. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Um, could you start by telling us, uh, telling people a bit about your background? Yeah, sure. So um, I started my career at Google. So I was there for just over two years um, and it was an amazing experience. I met so many brilliant people who um, I have the privilege to call um, friends. And it was like doing a sort of mini MBA, um, but getting paid for it. Um, after Google, I uh, did some consulting for a Google client, actually, um, and then have since worked in sort of digital businesses, large and small. As a side project, I have set up a, a venture called Exactimo, which uh, specializes in uh, teaching uh, digital programs at, at business schools because I had many friends who did MBAs and they were always saying that actually, while the MBA programs were, were fantastic and um, you know, they learned a ton, um, what they really wanted was um, practical digital skills to complement that more theoretical curriculum. Um, so back in 2018, I contacted London Business School and uh, I, I offered to deliver a boot camp that I'd put together based on uh, my experience at Google. And I was surprised to find 180 people turn up um, and everyone said it was um, you know, fantastic and, and a really, really good uh, session. And since then I've um, delivered it at, I think 18 of Europe's top 20 now. Um, so it's really exciting. That's great. Um, we'll get into a lot about the work that you do through Exactimo, but first what, how did your interest in technology come about? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I've always been interested in new things and 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 things that are going to you know transform society. So I actually remember as a kid, I used to watch all of Apple's yeah the Apple Mac ads, um, and they always intrigued me because they were they were different and they weren't like anything I'd I'd seen before. And I've always uh, being quite entrepreneurial. So at, throughout university, I you know, had the classic sort of side hustles. And um, after I graduated, I took over a salad bar and realized that I could use technology to uh, make it more efficient. Uh, the salad bar was really, really busy over lunchtime. So I developed a little piece of technology to called the fast lane that meant that people could pre-order thereby smoothing demand and supply. Um, so yeah, I've just always been been fascinated by by business and, and and how technology can improve business. So you've worked with many MBAs through uh, your side hustle, Exactimo. What are some of these digital skills that you think are important for uh, business school graduates today? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think at a fundamental level, you know, business is now digital. Um, so every single business person needs digital skills to survive and thrive. I think specifically for MBA students, uh, you know, they all need a solid understanding of how Google, Facebook, Amazon as platforms work, because you know, these platforms are the engines of growth for most businesses, you know, irrespective of vertical. I also think, and this is, this is quite surprising, it's something that I've learned over time um, by delivering um, the, the boot camps, that most MBA students actually need to understand the art and science of 
customer acquisition and um, retention, even if they don't want to work in marketing. I mean, if we think about management consultancies, the likes of Bain, BCG, um, McKinsey, all of these organizations have huge uh, digital practices, which are, are growing um, very quickly. Um, and they're undertaking you know, these huge uh, assignments to help more traditional companies transform. So actually having practical digital skills is just as important to these companies as being able to crack you know, the, the classic case interviews. Likewise, if you want to work in product, which a lot of business school students do now, you know, that requires an appreciation of, of digital. It requires an appreciation of um, you know, how, how customers think and how you can get them to do what you want them to do. And lastly, I know a lot of business students want to either work in startups or, or set up their own ventures. Um, you know, having uh, an appreciation of um, you know, digital marketing is, 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 is absolutely critical. And then lastly, I would say that you know, the power of you know, data-driven decision-making is uh, absolutely uh, critical. Um, it, uh, I mean, in, in Silicon Valley, there's a, there's a famous saying that what gets measured you know, gets improved. Um, and, and you can see that the best businesses now are the ones that you know, have the best data and then are able to, to actually analyze the data that they have to deliver best in class customer experiences. If you think about Netflix with their personalization engine, if you think about Spotify, if you think about Amazon. Um, so having, having um, both the knowledge and the skills to be able to understand, analyze and, and, and make data informed decisions is, is really, really important. Thanks, Frederick. That's There's quite a lot there to unpack. Um, but first, I just want to remind people that if you've got any questions for Frederick, please pop them into the comments, whether you're watching this on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Um, but Frederick, I wanted to go back to the, the first thing you said about understanding how these platforms acquire and retain customers. But you know, customer acquisition, customer retention have always been the, I guess, foundations for any successful business. So what's different now with uh, your tech platforms? Yeah, so I think the fundamental difference is that they are machines and they are at their core algorithms. So you actually need to understand um, what these machines want to be fed, because if you understand what how these how these machines work, you can then you know, optimize them to your advantage. So j just an, just an example. Um, so Google paid search ads are the thing that makes Google most of its money. And they're also the thing which. Uh, you know, every single business will will use to, to get customers. And the reason why it's so powerful is because um, Google is placing an ad in front of somebody when they're actually looking for that product and service. Now, what most people don't understand is that it's not just about money that determines how high up you get in, in, in the ad um, rankings. There's actually a component called quality score, which uh, is all about relevance. And um, Google at its core is, is a meritocracy. So if you understand... Um, what Google means by relevance, you can then design ads which are optimized for that platform. And then all other things being equal, you will end up paying less than, than your competition. Like that's just one example. And so I think that's the, that's the main difference is that these are, are machines um, and we need to understand how they work so that we can use them properly. Yeah. Is that the same kind of approach when you're looking at a product manager within these platform companies as well? Yeah, so so I think um, if you look at all of the the product management roles that are are, are in uh, Amazon, Facebook, or, or Google, a lot of them are working on um, the, the 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 technology that powers um, advertising. So actually, having that that base knowledge of how these um, systems work mean that in interview situations, you you immediately stand out from the crowd. I mean, I was always um, fascinated at, at how little people knew about. Um, Google in Google interviews um, and I speak to friends at Facebook and Amazon and it's exactly the same like if in an interview situation you can't explain what the business does and, and, and what powers its business model then um, frankly you, you haven't got uh, a hope in hell yeah I I know the the term that people use to describe it is flywheel right so Google with this huge data search business uh, same with you know like Amazon and Facebook with that data they they can then use this, it's almost like a, a cycle that just keeps going and it can lend them to branch off into other sectors. 
So yeah, Absol understanding the inquiry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think what's interesting about big tech is you can, and this is something I do in the boot camp is you can deconstruct all of their business models and, and place them in a flywheel because they all have this like self-reinforcing um, uh, virtuous circle that, that makes them unstoppable. And, and that's one reason why you know, regulators are paying such close attention. It, one really, really interesting book, actually, if, if, if people are interested in this, is, is a book called The Everything Store by Brad Stone. And it's about yeah. um, how Amazon um, has built its business. And you know, within the book, Brad Stone makes very clear that Jeff Bezos has intentionally architected his business to be a set of interlocking flywheels. So he deliberately um, designs Amazon to to have this self reinforcing self optimization um, dynamic. All right. You you also talked about um, data analytics, right? Mm -hmm. Which is obviously been the hot thing over the last five years as you have cloud computing machine learning and, and, and cheaper computing power. Um, many students approach me and think okay, they need to be really strong in Python, machine learning. Um, is that really the case for an MBA student or a business school graduate? So I think it depends which role you want to get into. Um, you know, if you were getting a, a data analyst job at Amazon, then they would expect you to have you know, really strong you know, Python um, you know, SQL skills. Um, but I think having an appreciation and being able to talk about the importance of why data driven decisions are, are, are so powerful is, um, uh, is enough for many for many functions. Um, and actually, there are some really, really excellent books out there which teach a lot of the more advanced like machine learning techniques in Excel. So there's actually a book called Data Smart that I recommend people read. And it's written by the, the data scientists of MailChimp, which is a, a, a oh. very successful, profitable um, um, uh, company. And, 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 and his whole book is kind of demystifying data science and, and, and allowing you to actually build these models um, using Excel formulas. Is that John W. Foreman, data science? Yeah, data John smart, Foreman. Using data science. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, just pulled it up. Yeah, yeah. he's okay. a really cool dude, actually. He's um, he's pretty quirky, um, but obviously very, very clever. Yeah. So do, do, are you saying that people don't need to be uh, a programming wizard to get into a tech company? Uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the amount of non-tech roles there are in tech, um, it's 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 astounding. I mean, if you think about like account management, sales, legal, marketing, operations, finance, like all of these are support functions which are incredibly important within within big tech. And I think that's going to be a trend that's only going to accelerate um, as big tech companies grow and as they become. Um, more in the crosshairs of regulators, they're going to need you know more legal people as they grow and they start entering e into each other's territory. They're, they're going to need to have better marketeers. Um, they're going to need more salespeople. It's 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 a real land of opportunity. All right, just a shout out to someone who's watching from who's joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. Thanks very much for joining us on on LinkedIn. Um, so Frederick, I know you run a boot camp, which is two hours, so it's really condensing things. But do you think that if someone doesn't have the sort of technical background before coming to business school, is it possible for them to pick up enough to get going through the interviews? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the the best way into a big tech company is to actually look at the experience that you have. And think, you know, how can I leverage that experience in 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 in, in a big organisation like you know, Facebook, Amazon, or, or Google? Um, so, you know, you, you everyone has you know great experience and great knowledge that um, they just need to package up um, in, in a way which makes you know, them them attractive. Um, that being said, there is definitely a base understanding or base knowledge that everybody needs. Um, and that knowledge can be easily acquired, hence um, the popularity of, of, of the boot camp. Um, so if you can go into an organization like Facebook and actually in an interview sh demonstrate that you understand the business, like demonstrate that you um, have a sense of where the business is headed, demonstrate that you understand the competition, demonstrate that you understand the algorithm, then 
you know, that is um, based knowledge that will really make a difference in impressing interviewers. The other thing yeah. that big, the other thing that big tech companies uh, also love is behavioral interviewing. Um, so if you can um, really, really practice uh, um, and, and package your experience up um, to make it compelling in, in in that interview environment, then that's uh, that's you know that's a major win. Yeah, Frederick, I think I've seen over the course of, I don't know, maybe the last five or six years, uh, tech companies moving from being very technical skills focused. And to some extent, Google may still be like that, you know, because it's quite a engineering nerd kind, to becoming more of this, embracing more general, people with more general sort of skills to help, uh, at least within their workforce, diversify the sort of skills. And I know uh, Amazon is one who emphasizes a lot about the uh, leadership principles, which I think Jeff Bezos talks a lot about. And mm. they, they, they do a lot of that interview. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I've actually, um, um, I, I actually interviewed someone called Tom Lawrence recently on, on my podcast, and he's done, you know, a thousand, um, a thousand Amazon interviews. He's pretty, he pretty much built the, uh, the, the recruitment function from European business schools. And um, yeah, he talks a lot about really understanding what those leadership principles um, and, 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 and being able to package your story um, in a way which um, uh, makes them uh, makes them fit those those principles um, and I think if you if you actually look at Amazon as a business what's fascinating is the the continuity or consistency of these leadership principles and how they still make a difference in the business I mean only recently Jeff Bezos stepped down right as or well, he announced that he was stepping down as CEO and, and he used the language of you know being in uh, a day day one um, and that's exactly the same language that he used in, in his original shareholder letter. Um, and I think that's one reason why they've been so successful. Okay, great. We've got a couple of comments and questions, but first, thanks very much to Beneth, Florian, Beneth from Edinburgh, Florence in Bucharest, Yunmei is joining us from Wuhan, uh, Fai is from New Delhi, Lissandro from Seville. Um, I think Lynn Terompi has a question about business models after the pandemic. But I think while you were talking, Frederick, about Tom Lawrence, I wanted to, if I could share this, uh, a clip, or at least a short introduction clip of your interview with Tom. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So, let me, so this is, uh, can you just give us an introduction about this? This is your your podcast on YouTube, is that right? Yeah, so um, as part of Exactimo, I've created a podcast called The Getting There Show, and I interview really, really interesting people about their careers to date, just to, to work out um, you know, what, what, what has inspired them to, to get to where they are today. And Tom is an amazing guy. He um, runs... A, a function at um, the side business school so he specializes in like tech careers but prior to that he as i said built amazon's uh, recruitment team from from business schools and we just have a really really great chat about um, his career but also about his tips on on how to to crack the amazon interview which are actually applicable to to any big tech company and actually any interview situation because more and more companies are are starting to interview like um, you know, like the, the Silicon Valley giants. All right, so let's just take a look at the first int the first couple of seconds of uh, your interview with Tom Lawrence. Hello, and welcome to the Getting There Show, where we speak with brilliant people and unpack the key influences and decisions that have helped them get to where they are today. You'll get the books the mental models, the inspirations, and all the steps in their journey to help guide you on your own path. As Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Today's giant is an awesome chap called Tom Lawrence, who after stints in event management, online startups, journalism, and marketing, joined what was then a small company from Seattle called Amazon, where he worked his way from digital marketing to building and running the team responsible for hiring business school graduates into Amazon's consumer and leadership programs across Europe. Okay, great. Yeah, Tom's a great guy. I've, I've spoken to him when he was with uh, Amazon. And yet, 
know, I've spoken to him a few times, but your interview through your interview, I still learned quite a quite a lot about him, uh, including how what was it, Mamma Mia, the, the yeah. movie, the first one, not the second one. So it just shows you how long ago this was. Uh, was really one of the biggest sellers when he was at Amazon, looking at those uh, distribution of films. I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and he also talks about what Amazon UK looked like um, right at the start, and it was. Um, so small that they were able to have all of their meetings in a in a Chinese restaurant in Slough. I think that's how uh, that's how embryonic it was. Yeah, I think Jeff Bezos. I think I can't remember whether it was in the Everyday Store where he talked about how he wanted teams small enough that they could be fed on is it one or two boxes of pizza? Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think I don't think Amazon quite functions like that anymore. It's just way too big. But I think that was that really shows the kind of mentality that you have in quite a lot of these tech platform companies that's quite different from, let's say, your traditional finance or even consulting, I think. Definitely. But what I think is interesting is all the traditional industries, so you know, consulting and finance um, being great examples, they're all, they're all trying to become more like the, the big tech companies. So you can see that in their office design. You can see that in the way that they phrase their job applications. You can see that even in their products, right? Um, you know, all the big banks are now you know, launching. So like Goldman Sachs, for instance, is launching its own um, you know, direct to consumer banking play. Um, and they all talk like the, uh, the big tech companies. Yeah. So, Frederick, why don't we take a break here and then take some of the questions? We've got a question here from Lynn Teronpi. Thanks very much. You're asking how business models are going to look like after the pandemic. I guess this is a question about whether these big these tech companies are just going to conquer the world even more, or is there something for a smaller player to come up? Yeah, it's a great question. So, as I as I mentioned earlier, I think the the power of big tech comes in the self reinforcing dynamic of their business models. So, actually, if you leave them unregulated they will just get smarter and stronger and stronger and stronger um, so i think what we'll see is greater regulation most definitely um, which will also open up um, opportunities um, for for other companies but we've also seen i think a, a distaste of big tech starting to emerge um, even among consumers so there's platforms like shopify which is a canadian e-commerce um, company which is has done incredibly well and they've built a almost like an anti-amazon which helps e-commerce businesses build up their own digital real estate gives them tools so that they can stand on their own feet without relying on amazon um, so i think without a doubt e-commerce is here to stay um, but you will over time see e-commerce companies relying less on big tech and and, and standing on their own two feet Okay. We've got this question from Hiroyuki in, in Tokyo. Uh, he works in a traditional B2B market and the customer is very conservative in the power electricity industry. I guess that's the kind of industry you don't want to be too risk, uh, sure. risk taking. <laughs> uh, and they see digital stuff as additional investments in this secondary. So how do these kind of companies change their minds? So I think if you look at B2B uh, industries, a lot of them have already changed and actually appear like B2C companies. Um, so I think if you look at um, uh, companies like uh, Wistia is an example, which is a, a, a video hosting platform, or I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of examples. The businesses that get it understand that they need to become digital because if they don't become digital, then somebody else will steal their lunch. Um, so I think to answer your question, how do you uh, convince them? I think you convince them by sh providing examples of other traditional B2B markets which have become digitized and examples of you know companies that have been too slow to move and have um, Lost, lost market share. Hmm. Yeah, I think about the big kind of industrial conglomerates that were almost business case 
uh, staples, maybe 10, 20 years ago, your GE, right? Um, everyone loved Jack Welch and what it did, but you look at GE now and you could say that they, they really missed the boat in terms of thinking, how do you bring technology, uh, things like uh, the, the internet of things, right? So that they can really transform not just their business, but also the business of their clients. And I think to me, the exciting thing about B2B is that right now there's still no platform out there and people are people like Siemens, I think Philips, they're, they're all trying to be that plat the same kind of platform for B2B that you, you see in the B2C market with Amazon, with Facebook. So if Hiroki, if you're working in this sector, you that might be one way to think about it, really. Definitely. I think the other, just very quickly, I think the other um, thing that you can um, bring to the table or the other insight you can bring to the table is the fact that even though B2B businesses are selling to businesses, businesses are collections of individuals. So you're never actually selling to a business. You're, you're selling to um, people who work in a business. And as digital becomes, you know, the default mode of operation, you're not going to be able to convince individuals in an organization, the decision makers, if you don't appear digitally savvy. We've got a question here from Harsh. And his question is, most of the businesses around the globe have done a good job reacting to the pandemic and going digital. I guess they've been forced to. Uh, well, what do you think the future is going to be? What skill set are these businesses going to look for when they when they hire for people? Yeah, so I think the past 12 months is a really good indication. So over the past 12 months, obviously, we've been in this you know, horrible um, pandemic. But if you look at the winners, they are all companies that are digitally native. So I think e-commerce penetration in the States jumped from something like 16% to 30% in you know, three weeks. There's that amazing graph, mm -hmm. um, which um, you may have seen, um, comrade. Um, so I think we can look at the past 12 months to understand what the skills are that are going to be required for the next 12 months. Um, and they are the things that I've already mentioned. So an appreciation of how e-commerce works, an appreciation of you know the large tech platforms that most companies rely on for, for getting and keeping customers, the ability to use data effectively um, to, to provide better customer experiences. You know, all of those things are gonna be uh, bedrocks of business moving forward. You know, the genie's out the bottle. We're not, we're not going back. Great. Uh, I think a very similar question from Florian, which is about working from an office or working remotely. Do you think that the future is going to be working re where? Re do you think there's a future where working remote is standard? Yeah, so I, I think we're going to go into a period of semi-remote working. Um, so I think we will end up going into the office maybe one or two times a week or one or two times every two weeks and that will be to meet other people i think the the days of having to go into an office to then sit at a desk and do tasks alone is is over and i actually think the reason for this is both a function of supply and demand i think businesses have come to realize that it does it makes it doesn't make financial sense to have a huge HQ say in London and pay you know two three million pounds a year when they can have a semi-remote workforce downsize the size of their office and still be as uh, productive and then I think from the demand side i.e from the employer side people have really enjoyed spending more time with their kids they've enjoyed not having to spend two hours a day commuting um, which is which has led them to actually enjoy the the, the remote lifestyle um, so, yeah, that's my answer. Semi-remote. Yeah. I've got a question from uh, Kai Yang Ti, and I think it's a follow-up to what, what you said earlier, Frederick, which is, you know, companies in traditional industries, how will they, what are some of the challenges that they'll encounter when making this digital transformation? So I think they'll have to invest so and they'll have to invest in technology and in new skills and and that's always difficult you know when when businesses have to actually you know put money on the table to to change um that they, they often find that um that that challenging 
I think they also need to change their mindset and not be so myopic in making decisions about what they should do just by looking at their industry. They, they've got to start you know, borrowing best practice from, you know, from other industries. Um, and again, that's, uh, that's very challenging. And then I think the last thing I would say is there's still definitely a knowledge asymmetry that exists, particularly in big business. So you've got people at the top who are less digital and people you know, at the bottom who are more digital. Um, and it's always difficult as a decision maker if you know that you don't have these skills. Um, and it's often better to just ignore um, what you don't know rather than admit you don't know something. So I think a lot of it's a human capital issue too. Yeah, I'm going to jump to this question from Sri because I think it, it's a nice follow-up to what you mentioned, right? Which is, And her question is, how does digital transformation affect social and organizational change within a company? So it's, I think it's how do these digital natives who are maybe at that first year, first, you know, that's junior level analysts, maybe the early associate roles, get their voices heard to those top. Mm. Yeah, I think it depends on the culture of the organization. If you're, if you're in a very traditional um, organization, which is quite deferential and quite um, hierarchical, then it's quite difficult to, to challenge the, 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 the people at the top. But I do think digital technologies like Slack um, and you know cloud communication tools have broken the mold and have made it uh, firstly possible and secondly um, uh, okay to uh, you know to uh, to voice your 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 feelings. Yeah, very great, good. Um, a couple of comments actually based on some of the answers we've got. Uh, like Lynn was mentioned, I think you mentioned Frederick. You mentioned Shopify, but obviously. In India, you've got Flipkart, yeah. right, which was, I think, acquired by Walmart. Right? Mm. And Walmart tried for years to break into India. They couldn't. And then they realized, actually, Flipkart was, I think, they, a couple of people from Amazon who started, you know, started mm. it. And it's, it's tremendously successful in, in, in India. I think this is also one thing, Frederick, you mentioned about these tech companies getting bigger and bigger. But... And you still talked about regulation and this backlash as two things that are pushing back against the tech companies. Mm -hmm. I think a case like Flipkart actually shows that there's a limit to how, how replicable your model can be. Because I remember Amazon trying to go into India and then they find out most people didn't have credit cards. Mm -hmm. You know, you, returns is terrible. Logistics is non-existent. You know, uh, if you wanted to build up logistics, just getting it across a state in India yeah. was going to be a big bureaucratic challenge and Flipkart to its credit. Um, and you, there are also counterparts in China that do this very well. They managed to localize their operations and they become so big now that it's incredibly difficult for someone like Amazon to get in. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and there are several other examples of um, big tech companies or other technology companies trying to break into a new market and finding it very difficult. So Indonesia is a great example, right? Mm -hmm. Indonesia geographically is a fascinating place. It's a collection of thousands of islands. Um, and I, 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 there's a, a company like Deliveroo in Indonesia, and that, that's been able to prosper because it understands you know, its geography. Um, and it's meant that it's been able to build a uh, a big customer base there um, and keep, you know, the, the, the big foreign companies out. Yeah. I think the, the, that that's uh, Gojek. Uh, and then there's also Grab right now in Indonesia. Yeah. And uh, the big breakthrough there was they started off uh, trying to be like Uber, but they didn't use cars because uh, for anyone who's been to Indonesia, if anyone who's been to Jakarta, the traffic is terrible. Everything is at a road, you know, is totally gridlock, and the only way to get around it is on these little scooters, and so so they got they hired a, recruited like an army of scooter drivers instead of car drivers, and that's how people zip through. When I was in Jakarta, I, I was I did consider going onto one of these, but it looked terribly, terribly <laughs> scary. <laughs> the other the other the other nice um, example there is Rocket Internet. So Rocket yeah. Internet is. Uh, a, a venture building company based in Germany and their proposition is to take 
ideas that have flourished elsewhere and and and, and localize them and, and, and bring them into Europe. I mean, they've had a mixed, um, you know, they've, they've had mixed results, um, but I think it, I think there is actually a business opportunity in, in trying to think of things that have worked elsewhere, which you can slightly adapt and tweak for, for your local market. And I think this is a great opportunity for business school graduates, really, um, people from around the world, where if you come to a place, uh, a business school, let's say, like Cambridge, where you get to meet other people and you get to understand how these platform economies, these flywheels work, right? Mm. And think about localizing it. Because ultimately, you're the only, someone in Seattle is not going to understand the, the market in Jakarta as well as someone from Indonesia. Absolutely. And, and that can provide a huge barrier to entry. Yeah. One comment here from Ben. Uh, I guess Ben works at Harry's. And for those who don't, don't know, Harry's is uh, a company that does a subscription shaver razor business. Right? So they saw a massive move from bricks and mortar to direct to customer. And they've retained many of these new direct to customer uh, customers despite the swing back towards retail. So it's an interesting year for Ben and people at Harry's, I guess, as well as the, all these kind of subscription types of businesses. Yeah, I mean the other the other um, you know, million dollar shave club is the the the, the classic example of um, you know a company which uh, saw the massive opportunity to go direct to consumer, and yeah. it did such a good job that Unilever bought them for a billion dollars. Um, but I love Harry's; they're great. Okay. Um, Yun Mei has a question about how capital markets will embrace technology, especially in investment management, uh, the kind of positions that could be replaced by machine learning, and how can MBA candidates prepare for this future? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think capital markets are um, have always been um, uh, you know, powered by technology, and there are parts of the, the 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 financial markets which are you know streets ahead in terms of their their adoption of of technology um, I think a lot of it will become automated I mean I'm no I'm no expert um, but you know there will always be the need for face-to-face -face communications I mean if all the decision making is is being done by a machine you can't just Give the machine to go and speak to the client. You, know, you you always need a human to to build that relationship and um, and and uh, you know translate what the machine's telling you into uh, you know a compelling pitch. Um, so yeah, I think that that's what I would say is it will become automated and has to many extent has to a large extent become automated. But there will always be humans who are you know at the coal face you know dealing with with clients. Yeah, and I. I'm reminded of this um, session that we had with our students earlier, I think last week, where we have an alum talking about legal and regulatory technology. Uh, it turns out that le legal firms, law firms are hopeless when it comes to technology. They're still using um, printed Word documents, maybe PDFs, uh, everything has to be signed. So there's a whole host of companies, especially around Cambridge, that are looking to doing very basic things like scanning legal documents, trying to standardize certain clauses. Uh, and they're not trying to replace wholesale the lawyer, but just making it easier for the lawyer so that the lawyer can focus on the more important parts of the contract yeah. rather than every other sort of standard phrases. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we got another question here from uh, Kaya uh, about Europe, the, the tech scene in Europe. Um, compared to China and the US. So why do you think that's the case? Um, yeah, I think there's still a, a myth that surrounds Silicon Valley, which makes it very magnetic. So if you're entrepreneurial and you're in the tech space, then you immediately assume that you need to go and move to, to San Francisco to be successful. And that's also self-reinforcing because the more people that are there who have believed that myth, then the more likely it is to that you're going to want to go and move there because you actually have a network of people now who are, 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 are setting up 
you know, technology companies. But I think Europe is changing. So if you look at the explosion of fintech in London, like fintech is now so, so, uh, or, or London has so many examples of fintech companies that have are, are doing incredible things. So I think it is it is definitely changing. And if you look at Berlin as another example, you know there are these technology hubs um, littered through Europe that are starting to develop you know game changing companies. You know, Spotify in Sweden, for instance, is is an example. Um, Transferwise in London is another example. Hmm. So. Um... Frederick, if I turn back to you, uh, I did ask you before, like, but you know, all these skills that MBAs or business school graduates need, what do you think are some of the best ways to pick up those skills from you know your experience in Exactimo? Yeah, so I mean, I I, I set up Exactimo for for this reason to provide um, training programs which get people up to speed in in, in the shortest possible time. Um, so I have a, a two-hour program called the Digital Boot Camp, which, as I've said, I've delivered now to 18 of the top 20 of um, Euro European business schools. Um, and many attendees who have done it um, have landed you know, jobs in tech and have described it as one of the best things they've been to at business school. So that's really exciting. Um, I've also developed an online program called the Digital Strength Course, which goes a bit deeper and provides a, a framework for analyzing and growing um, any company. And it has a big focus on employability. And actually, just last month, I, I received a message from a student who had, had done the program, and they had used a lot of the framework and a lot of the knowledge to, to knock the socks off um, uh, interviewers. And, 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 and they've, they've, they've had no digital background before, but have landed a, a dream digital job. Um, so yeah, the best way of picking up these skills is by, you know, reading information you know there's loads and loads of um uh there's loads and loads of um you know great courses out there but obviously i've i've built courses to to solve this very problem cool frederick um i guess one last question from me before we wrap up which is what's some of the things that or maybe two or three things that you you, you would say uh business school students should not do as they think about working in these tech companies in terms of things that they shouldn't do when they apply? Yeah, so the sort of common pitfalls. Yeah, so I think the main one is make, make, make sure you're prepared. So don't go in there unprepared. I mean, big tech, as you, you mentioned, Comrade, is, is I think probably the, one of the number one of the, the the most popular career destinations for business school students and so if you if you haven't prepared then you you, you don't have a, a hope in hell of 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 getting a job um, and preparing is easy like information is out there um, you, know, you, you you need to have a really really solid understanding of what that company does you know how it makes its money um, who its competitive threats are um, and you need to take a view on you know what that business you know, should be doing. So that's one. Um, the other one is to not um, underestimate your previous experience. So actually, the fact that you've got into business school means that you've had a colourful, rich, uh, uh, and 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 you know, successful career to date. So make sure that you you know look backwards and you know cherry pick all the things that have got you to where you are today and package them in a in a story that's that's really going to resonate with um with with the with the big tech companies but i think those two would be my uh yeah, that would be my answer so make sure you prepare and um you know don't underestimate all the good work you've already done well thank you very much frederick that's all the time we have for today and i want to thank everyone who's uh, been watching this you love your questions and we'll be back uh, in a few weeks with a talk on LinkedIn and how you can boost your profile on social media. Till next time, thanks very much from me, Conrad, and from Frederick. Thanks, guys.